May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. If you were paying attention, you heard that in Psalm 19, didn't you? So that's where we get that today. You've already learned something, so you've benefited from coming. Uh, okay, so uh, we have uh, hopefully pens in the pews and pieces of paper. We're going to have a test on what the Ten Commandments of God given to Moses are. I'm sure everyone's going to get a perfect score. Do you know that if we really did this, it would be interesting to see how many you would get, right? It, you know, there's four or five of them that are easy. But uh, I tried it off the top of my head. And I could get to like eight or nine, and I just couldn't get all ten, and I couldn't figure it. I went back and looked, and I kind of conflated a couple of the things about uh, God being uh, the God who brought them out of Egypt, and he is their God, and they're not supposed to bow down to any other uh, idols and this and that. So I conflated it too. I came up short myself, so don't feel bad. Augustine wrote that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God himself. C.S. Lewis says that each one of us has a God-shaped hole inside of us. A God-shaped hole inside of us that only God can fill. And the problem with human life as far back as you can look into this very day, is that we human beings seek to fill that heart, that God-shaped hole, with anything else other than God himself. Isn't that pretty much the situation? That's the problem. The problem is we try to fill that hole with something other than God. That's really the heart and the nature of sin itself. We're in this pursuit of trying to fill that ache of the human heart for wholeness. We know that we have this need, this hole, this lack. We know that we know the good, but we don't always do it. That's just part of the human dilemma to try to seek all the things of the world, all the people of the world, and we consume them in a selfish way to fill that hole. Well, we need to fill that hole, that void, that ache with God himself. That's the only solution to the human dilemma. And one of the principal ways that we fill that hole with God is, is that we worship God. We worship God. Now, uh, worship is a huge, huge topic, and we could spend much time on it, but as I told Bob uh, earlier today, I really need 45 minutes to do this sermon, but I don't have 45 minutes to do this sermon. But uh, worship is our offering of ourselves to God. So it's an outward worship, we are offering ourselves to God in thanksgiving and praise, glorifying God. We are seeking God. We are revealing ourselves to God. And that's something that is difficult for people to do because of that hole, because of that sense of need. We sometimes feel guilty. We sometimes feel unworthy. We're totally distracted in our uh, culture. And so... It is the opening up of our human life to God, giving ourselves, our souls and bodies, giving God the worship that God is due as our creator and our redeemer, uh, our life giver. And so it is something that uh, we are supposed to be about. It is a duty of sorts, but real worship comes from a response of love from us. Real worship cannot be demanded and just paid out like a, a checklist. 
And it can't be done in ritual where people are going through a certain number of motions of their religion, whatever it is, and their heart not be connected to God. So we can be going through what might be called worship, but if our hearts are not connected to God, are not open to God, and in fact, even deeper, are not loving God as a response to God's prior love, then worship, in some sense, is not taking place. Well, William Barclay would also add that real worship doesn't occur just on Sunday. It occurs all week long, every single day, as we rise, and the first thought we should have is to bless and praise God for the very fact that you woke up breathing and moving and living. That's reason enough. We can just start right there. There's a whole nother long list of things that we could bless and praise God for, but just the fact that we woke up uh, that's how we start. So it's an everyday thing, but Barclay goes to say uh, one step further, real worship, he says, is the offering of everyday life to God. Everyday life to God. That means after we wake up and we say, bless the Lord, thank you, Lord, uh, however you want to do it, and hopefully after you say some quick prayers, you are offering your day to God. And most of us know, in general, what we're going to do with that day, right? I know, I know exactly what I'm going to do that day unless there's an emergency or some unforeseen thing because I know exactly who I have uh, appointments with. I know exactly what I need to accomplish. I know exactly where I'm probably going to eat lunch. Uh, the whole day is laid out. So we offer that to God and ask that God would be with us in it and that God's will would be done through it by his grace and power and mercy. So it's not that difficult. We know that we have to take care of kids or we have to go to the office or we're going to stay home and we're going to Zoom things all day long because that's all we can do right now. <laughs> we need God to Zoom all day long, I guarantee you. Someone said that we are dysfunctional if we're not operating by the Spirit of God. The only way we are functional human beings is that the Spirit of God is in our hearts, in our minds, our souls, our bodies. We are, we are running on the Spirit of God. We can get dysfunctional so fast because rather than the Spirit of God, we begin to look around to see who or what can fill that God-shaped hole. So every day is an opportunity to either worship and invite God once again into that place that only belongs to God and can only be fulfilled by God, or we turn to someone else or something else or some other thing in this world. Or now you can just turn to your phone or your tablet or your computer and go into another world of time and space and some kind of bizarre reality. Uh, so that's another way to fill that God-shaped hole. Well, let's just briefly talk about our worship today. We are here to worship in spirit and in truth. We're here to offer God ourselves, our souls, and bodies. I reminded the uh, First Communion class and the parents yesterday that worship is directed to God. We come here to worship God. We don't come here to get something out of a service. And we don't come here to critique a service as if we are the ones who are in charge. In fact, 
you could say God is critiquing us in our worship. Now God is loving, but God is truthful. <laughs> so we would hear the truth of God if we were able to hear God about whether our hearts are truly in this worship or whether we're distracted, and of course we're distracted. We have to try to worship. We have to try to maintain our focus or we'll start thinking about what we're going to do later today or where we're going to eat lunch or why that woman has that dress on and or whatever, whatever distraction, you know, that beautiful gal, uh, whatever it is. So this is something that we need God's help every step of the way. In our collect, we talk about needing to be empowered in our inner life because the distractions of our mind and our heart are constantly running through us. And that's why we need to refocus. That's why we need to take a deep breath. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need the scriptures. That's why we need this place. That's why we need each other. That's why we need this altar and table to meet God and to be filled with God's own presence in Jesus. And that's what is about to happen in a few moments. We are going to again recount the wonderful events that God has done for us through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Bob is going to say a prayer of great thanksgiving. One of the most important things that your children learned was is that Eucharist means thanksgiving. I'm going to ask them to say that to you, so, but I already know that they know it because I asked them. That was the first question I asked them yesterday when we met so we could get all prepared for this day. But with joy and with thanksgiving in our hearts, we were able to come here to be together as the people of God to receive the presence of Jesus to fill that God-shaped hole, to take his rightful place on the throne as our Lord and our God and our Savior, who is perfect love. Why wouldn't there be a million people here today? The missing component is worship. And I know that we've been separated because we've needed to be separated, but, oh, I cannot wait for us to get back together on a regular basis to be a part of the most fulfilling thing that we can do, the most important thing we can do all week long, and that is meet to worship God and to be filled with the very life and the love of God. It is the most important thing we can do personally, corporately, as a community. So let us with joy give thanks to God for his great love and mercy to come and meet us this very day in worship. <laughs>